Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome to Talking Tudors episode 165. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to begin by sharing some very exciting news with you. My new non-fiction book, The Final Year of Anne Boleyn, is now available for pre-order. I worked on this book for almost three years, but it's really the culmination of the last 13 years of study and research into the life and times of Anne Boleyn. I would be incredibly honoured if you'd consider pre-ordering a copy. Pre-publication sales are so important to authors, which is why it would mean so much to me. The final year of Anne Boleyn will be published in the UK on the 30th of November and in the US in early 2023. You can pre-order your copy today from a number of online retailers, including the Book Depository, which offers free worldwide shipping. I'd also like to thank everyone who's chosen to support my podcast on Patreon and a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Please visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors to join the family. All patrons are eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. On the weekend of the 30th and the 31st of July, I'll be speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Norton about her book, The Temptation of Elizabeth Tudor, and the distressing events that took place when the young Elizabeth went to live with the newlyweds Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tutors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag I love Talking Tutors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to discuss her latest book, Devil Land, is Claire Jackson. Claire is the senior tutor of Trinity Hall, Cambridge University. She has presented a number of highly successful programs on the Stuart dynasty for the BBC and is the author of Charles II in the Penguin Monarch series. Her book, Devil Land, England Under Siege, 1588 to 1688, won the Wolfson History Prize this year. Our conversation is coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome to Talking Tutors, Claire. How are you? Very good, thank you. Many thanks for having me. Yes, and I should start by saying congratulations on the wonderful news that I read, when was it last week possibly, of winning the Wolfson History Prize? I think I'm still in shock. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was now about a fortnight ago and it still doesn't feel very real. But um, joining the list of stellar list of previous prize winners is genuinely daunting. It's a terrific honour. Yes, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we are here to talk about your book, Devil Land, England Under Siege, 1588 to 1688. So tell us a little bit about this particular book. Its inspiration lay, perhaps curiously, from some television films I made back in 2014, 2015, that were called The Stuarts uh, and The Stuarts in Exile. They originally made for the BBC, but then obviously they've been sort of sold to many other channels. But they were sort of conceived in terms of thinking about Britain in the 17th century as a multiple monarchy and the interrelationships between England, Scotland and Ireland and to a lesser extent Wales and how the Stuart monarchy sort of intersected with that geopolitical arrangement. It was written against the backdrop of the um, Scottish independence referendum in 2014 and, you know, reimagining a different kind of constitutional relationship within the British Isles. And uh, I didn't write a book to accompany that series. Um, I wanted to sort of focus on the series. So the seeds for devil land the more time i spent we spent a lot of time filming on the continent so we went to madrid sort of following in the steps of the prince of wales in 1623 we did a lot of filming in breda we did a lot of filming in paris and the more time i spent abroad thinking about the Stuarts, the less english they seemed and the more that they began to be seen as in my mind as a foreign dynasty you know, they were imported um, from scotland in 1603 and not necessarily a dynasty that could be relied upon to act in england's interests I sort of became interested as the, in the Stuarts as this sort of prism to sort of study how England interacted with its continental neighbours and its sort of geopolitical situation. You know, each of the Stuart kings, for example, including James VI and I, had a wife that was either overtly or covertly Catholic, and they had a whole sort of series of dynastic and confessional and patronage attachments already. Um, and I was just interested in, you know, resituating England in the 17th century in the eyes of foreign commentators and devil land or Deufel land was what the Dutch anonymous pamphleteer called England in 1652. Wonderful. So, so let's start the story maybe by you just painting a picture for us of what was happening in England and around the world as well in 1588, where this, the story begins in this book. Yeah, the story begins a few months earlier, um, or at least Devil Land's story begins a few months earlier, really with the spectacle of a state execution, the moment when Elizabeth I signed the execution uh, warrant, the death warrant for um, her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, who was an anointed queen of Scotland. She'd been a queen consort of France. Uh, she was also a kinswoman, but she had a long track history of fermenting Catholic conspiracies that were aimed at undermining the Elizabethan regime. And uh, she was put on trial uh, behind closed doors in 1586. And in 1587, uh, Elizabeth signed the death warrant and the execution was carried out again behind closed doors in, in, in Northamptonshire in England. And that execution sent shockwaves around continental Europe. The idea that a a queen who met most of Catholic Europe regarded as a sort of bastard heretic anyway, could contemplate putting to death, you know, a divinely ordained sovereign, you know, was was, was really unthinkable. And as you probably know, um, that had already been the subject of uh, excommunication by the Pope. So a lot of Catholic Europe started thinking, you know, one execution, that of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, justified the execution of that papal bull and that real action had to be taken. So while Spain had always been thinking for, for decades about the enterprise of England launching some kind of hostile attack on England. Mary Queen of Scots's uh, execution gave even more sort of added force to that motivation. Uh, so when the Armada, uh, so the, the book really opens with Mary Queen of Scots's execution, followed by um, the Spanish Armada the following year, a lot of the language used to justify that attempt on England was, you know, vindication for this Catholic martyr, as Mary Queen of Scots quickly came to be seen, sort of vindication for her spilt blood. So if we Thinking about the end of Elizabeth's reign, maybe tell us a little bit more about what Elizabeth's relationship was like at that point with Catholic Europe, but also who were her main allies at that point? Well, one of the interesting contrasts that I draw in most of the book with the Stuarts, with the Elizabethan regime, is just how much more proactive the Stuarts were in terms of foreign representation. Elizabeth 
never left England. She didn't have ambassadorial representation in any other Catholic country except for France. And when James VI and first came to the throne in 1603, he'd already ruled Scotland as an adult monarch for 20 years and as a minor for 20 years before that. He's a very experienced monarch who um, was very used to having a large range of foreign ambassadors, both at his court, but also Scottish representation overseas. So what you really get is a, is a real sea change in London of a huge number of diplomatic delegations appearing in London, wanting to establish permanent residences you know, whether it's the Venetians or the Spaniards or, or Protestant states, uh, just this huge sort of constellation of foreign observers, foreign ambassadors. And it's really their perspective that informs much of Devil Land. But I think the other thing we need to remember, just going back to 1588, is most English are expecting some kind of war of succession on their doorstep at any moment. I mean, Elizabeth is really remarkable as an early modern monarch in banning discussion of her successor and actually making it a capital crime. And in some ways you could see this as kind of highly irresponsible. The one thing a monarch is supposed to do is sort of, you know, look after, sort of steward a country for, for future generations. And by banning any discussion of her successor, I mean, you could see Elizabeth really as quite irresponsible. And a lot of mainland Europe, whether Catholic or Protestant, expect that there will simply just be a civil war, you know, perhaps with foreign intervention by Spain or by France on her death. And although Elizabeth, as we know, lives to be in her late 60s, dies in 1603. You know, nobody knows that in 1588. So most of the 1590s are spent, you know, sort of assuming at any moment that Elizabeth could die. I mean, she enters her sixth decade, which none of her Tudor forebears had done, uh, with no provision made for the succession. James VI has the strongest hereditary claim, and he's a Protestant, and he lives you know, next door in Scotland, but he was specifically excluded from the succession by Henry VIII's will. The Spanish have uh, made it very clear that they think they have an interest. And, you know, there's at least about 10 or 12 people who can be identified as having a claim to succeed Elizabeth. So most people just envisage complete carnage and chaos um, on her death. That's amazing. I didn't realise there was quite so many parties that, that felt they had a claim to, to the throne. So how was it all decided then in the end? Not so much decided, maybe, but sort of managed. James in Scotland plays a very skillful game of... He spends most of the 1590s sort of focused on uh, ensuring that he should succeed Elizabeth to what he regards both as his strongest hereditary claim, but also uh, it would clearly be a very big coup for the Stuart dynasty to acquire England and Ireland as well. Um, and he does that quite skillfully through negotiating with Catholic Europe, reassuring the papacy, reassuring countries like Spain, with whom he has a perfectly amicable relationship, whereas Elizabethan England is continually at war with Spain. You know, there's no there's no war between Scotland and Spain. So he takes a lot of effort through his um, diplomats and through ambassadors at his court to reassure Catholic Europe that you know he is not a, a persecutor. I mean, in some ways, ironically, a lot of Catholics have high hopes of James. When he comes to the throne, you know, he is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who is often regarded as sort of posthumously as a Catholic martyr. He um, is famously tolerant of Catholics and has a lot of high ranking Catholics in his administration in Scotland. From the mid 1590s onwards, people begin to suspect that his wife, Anna of Denmark, has covertly converted to Catholicism. So actually, some of the Catholics uh, gentry who, for example, spearhead the gunpowder plot in 1605, much of their original enthusiasm for James had been predicated on a, on a hope that you know he could yet be persuaded to change his religion. There's also the, the sort of precedent of Henri IV of France, who had famously or apocryphally said, you know, Paris was worth a mass. You know, to get the Spanish, uh, French crown, he would abandon Protestantism and become a Catholic. And you know, some Catholics hoped that really James could be persuaded to rejoin the Catholic fold. He's a staunch Calvinist. He, he there's, there's no way he's going to. And they become very disillusioned once they realise that as King of England. He's going to keep the same framework of persecutory legislation that Elizabeth had put in place. And some of that frustration and disillusionment is really what lies behind the gunpowder plot. But, you know, James has played this successful sort of waiting game. He also, towards the end of Elizabeth's reign, opens up a very important channel of secret communication with Elizabeth's key counsellors, you know, particularly Cecil and others that are that are very close to Elizabeth, works you know, through couriers, through codes and through secret correspondence, you know, to reassure them to ensure that at the moment that Elizabeth dies, a courier is sent immediately to Edinburgh. He is immediately proclaimed king. And most people are surprised at the at the peaceful nature of his succession. It had also been the case that because Elizabeth had banned um, debate of the succession in the 1590s, uh, an English-born Jesuit, Robert Parsons, had really ignited the debate on the continent by publishing accounts of the English succession abroad, backing 
some of the Spanish Habsburg claims, the Archduchess Isabella in Brussels and others. And the minute that start of literature started appearing abroad, it was then easier for James to launch his own counter to a Protestant propaganda, you know, sort of articulating his own claim to, to counter these Catholic arguments. And to most English, he looked very attractive. He was a Protestant experienced king. He had three children, you know, two sons, Henry Charles and a daughter, Elizabeth. Um, he was bringing a royal family to England for the first time, you know, for half a century. And as I say, he was a very experienced uh, monarch who had also published manuals on kingship so people could read works like the Silicon Door and all the true law of free monarchy if they wanted to find out more about how he might rule in practice. Um, and he was also by this stage known to Elizabeth's councillors and respected by them. So how long did he rule for, Clint? So he took over as King of Scotland when he was 13 months old in 1567. Uh, he became King of England in 1603 and he ruled until his death in 1625. So 22 years in England and can do the maths uh, a lot longer <laughs> in Scotland, well into his 60, 60 years in Scotland. And was his a popular rule? Sort of probably by historians often been overshadowed by the mid-century civil wars in England. So a lot of people look at the 1640s and the collapse of royal authority that occurred under his son, Charles I, and say, well, how much of that could you trace back to James? There are aspects of, clear aspects of tension. It was in James's reign, not Charles, that the um, that the Pilgrim Fathers set sail for New England in the Mayflower in 1620. So, you know, there were clearly Puritan elements of his English population that were dismayed that he didn't intend a further reformation of the church. Uh, there were structural problems with crown finance, but it was also a wonderfully sort of vivid period. There was a lot of interest in overseas uh, expansion. This was the sort of era of things like the Virginia Company, the Bermuda Company. There was also uh, very much the era of Shakespeare's plays and a lot of expansion of architecture and exploration and uh, and also the longest period of domestic peace that England had known. I mean, immediately on arriving on the English throne, James made clear he wanted to sue for peace with Spain. He he had no quarrel with Spain. So whereas, you know, Elizabethan England was was often sort of disrupted in Tudor rebellions domestically or, or this long running, very expensive and draining war with Spain. You know, the, the Stuarts in that sense brought both domestic peace under James and foreign peace as well. OK, and so following James the first death in 1625, who are the monarchs that, that come after that? So after James dies, he's succeeded by his son, Charles I. Um, Charles I rules until the early 1640s. You know, when I say rules, he rules, you know, ac actively. But then his authority collapses. Uh, England, Scotland and Ireland all sort of descend into civil war through the 1640s. And Charles is executed on the English Parliament's orders in 1649. There are then 11 years of uh, what we now call interregnum, which makes it sort of seem quite, quite neat. That, you know, one, re one rule, end, one king ends um, his authority in 1649. And in 1660, Charles I's eldest son, Charles II, is, is recalled by the English Parliament and takes office. You know, at the time, obviously, it wasn't seen as an interregnum. England became a commonwealth and then later a protectorate under Oliver Cromwell. And there were different sort of constitutional arrangements in those 11 years. In 1660, Charles II is re-established as a monarch. He rules until his death of natural causes in 1685. He is succeeded by his Catholic uh, younger brother, James VII and II, uh, because although Charles II produces lots of children, none of them are legitimate, and he doesn't have a legitimate heir with his wife, Catherine of Braganza. So as I say, James VII of Scotland, II of England, takes over in 1685. But that's a very short, traumatic reign as he sets about trying to re-Catholicise the British Isles. Uh, and eventually he flees uh, in 1688 when his Dutch son-in-law and nephew, William of Orange, again invades England in 1688. So the book Devil Land is, is sort of bookended by these two attempts at seaborne invasion. In 1588, the Spanish attempt uh, an invasion through the English Channel, but storms and poor communications um, and an attack by the English Navy mean that they fail. 100 years later, uh, William of Orange launches a massive seaborne invasion and lands at Torbay and Devon in 1688. And that is a seaborne invasion that ultimately succeeds, uh, partly because it's, or primarily because it's a Protestant one. Right. And, and what was life like for just the ordinary man and woman, you know, during, it's obviously a long period, but during the, the rule of the Stuart Kings? I think it depended very much where you were in society. Living through the civil wars would have been sort of immensely traumatic. And it, it really was an experience in which, you know, much as one sees in horrendous civil wars today, you know, brothers could take up arms on different sides of the divide, uh, either fight for parliament or for king. 
you know, at other times, London is the fastest growing city in the world and expands enormously. You know, if you went to some of the sort of Shakespeare plays or later in the century attended some of the Royal Society debates, it would be, or went to some of the new coffee houses that are springing up all over London, it would be, you know, remarkably sort of exciting and sort of febrile time. So I think much would depend on on where your position in society was. Absolutely. And and how was 17th century England viewed by some of its closest neighbours? Well, the th- I mean, I, I, I make very clear at the beginning of Devil Land that it is a sort of self-consciously polemical argument. What I'm interested in doing is sort of challenging this comfortable narrative that a lot of 17th century historians have often told of the sort of steady emergence of liberty and commercial prosperity and religious tolerance and actually said, well, for most of the 17th century, you know, the themes that I think are resonant are precarity and instability and vulnerability. And, and that is sort of captured by the name Devil Land. Um, it was a it was a pun on medieval Latin sort of joke that the English, the Angli, were always to be cherished as um cherubic sort of angeli angels and in 1652 this dutch pamphleteer just sort of says this is ridiculous you know they're fallen angels uh three years earlier they put their divinely ordained king charles the first on trial they created this sort of unrepentant uh commonwealth government and now this unrepentant republican government was intending to declare war on the dutch uh, the protestant dutch you know for commercial reasons and to the dutch and to many continental observers the english are a you know very unstable and very sort of unpredictable race um who seem to lurch from one sort of regime change to another who have a sort of very mixed confessional arrangement with catholic ireland and presbyterian scotland and episcopalian england and uh yeah ripe for interference or influence or even invasion it sounds like an incredibly tumultuous period, that's for sure, but very interesting. So anyone listening that wants to learn more, obviously, about the 17th century, I recommend everyone go and look for Devil Land. It's fantastic. Now, are you working on anything else, Claire, at the moment? Yes, <laughs> I, I am writing a book on James the Sixth and First. He died, as we said, in 1625. So this is a book for 2025, sort of 400 years later to sort of stand back and reassess. It's So yeah, it has a sort of non-movable deadline as well for submission. Um, but it's a sort of series of interlinked essays about James and his huge sort of intellectual influence in many areas like politics, witchcraft, religion, the law, uh, and all sorts of things. Well, that sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Something to look forward to. Now, at the end of episodes, what I normally ask my guests is for a two to take away, but please feel free to provide us with a Stuart one if, if you'd rather. Just something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. So do you have a suggestion for us? Uh, there are some really, really wonderful sort of website, you know, things like the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust has terrific sort of interactive texts and documents. So does the Folger Shakespeare Library um, in the States. There's also a wonderful sort of rem- Remembering the Reformation website. But there are also just some wonderful writers. Um, Jessie Childs is a wonderful, she's just written a book actually about the English Civil Wars in the 17th century, Basing House, but um, she started as a 16th century historian. It's a wonderful book on Surrey, um, The Noble. Susan Brigden also writes on the writer uh, Wyatt. Uh, the National Portrait Gallery's online collection of pictures uh, is also wonderful to explore. Um, and if you're in or around London in and want to sort of really experience uh, some of what I think I talk, you know, what I what I want to capture in Devil Land is the sort of Stuart's foreignness. Uh, the wonderful Peter Paul Rubens Baroque ceiling and banqueting hall is, you know, really hard to think um, that this is a sort of Protestant English um, installation. Well, you've given us so many wonderful suggestions. Thank you so much. And I will add links to those in the show notes. And to find out more about you, can listeners go to a website? Perhaps? Yes, I have a website. Yes, I have a website. Right. I haven't updated it since the um, <laughs> prize win, <laughs> but I will. I will. Yes. Yes, you'll have uh, to do that. The- Claire ja- uh, again, you can add the web link, but I think something like claire-jackson.com. Or something like that. Sure, I'll add that as well. But thank you so much. I know you've got a lot on, so I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking Tudors slash Stuarts with us today. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group 
group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Music